Greetings and welcome everyone. This is fantasy and automotive artist Ed Beard Jr. This is a series called Artist Ed Beard Jr. Time-Lapse Demos and Instruction Series. But before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about me. I've been illustrating for books, games, and licensed products for the entertainment and collectible industry for almost 40 years now. I've worked on products such as Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering cards, Tolkien Lord of the Rings, and other card games, magazine covers, children book covers. I've done the Dragon Calendar that you found at Barnes and Nobles and Borders, and over a thousand licensed products from jigsaw puzzles, cell phone covers, to throw blankets. I specialize in old school, hand painted, hand drawn craftsmanship using tangible mediums. I've also been an automotive airbrush artist since 1980. My airbrush work can be found at major car shows and industry trade shows like SEMA, where I usually have a featured vehicle. And to learn more about my automotive airbrush work, check me out at airbrushbybeard.com. All of the links are in the video description as well as the end credits. So once again, thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Welcome everyone, this is fantasy and automotive airbrush artist Ed Beard Jr. And you're watching the series called Artist Ed Beard Jr. Time-Lapse Demos and Instruction Series. Tonight we're doing part two of the Yin Yang Dragon. This is a drawing that I started in part one and it is the process of shadowing and shading. It's also going over some of the basic explanations of how the piece came to be, the symbolism that is contained within it. This is a combination of both realistic shadowing, light and shade, but also very design oriented. It's very graphic. So without further ado, let us begin the process and explaining some of the tools we're using. So it is the yin yang dragon. In part one, you saw how we began the female dragon, which was on the top and we shadowed her. You'll note that I put in some of the background cosmos just to give some contrast up against the fire and some of the brighter elements, the five elements, which is fire, mountain, iron ore, water, and wood. Notice the direction of the rotation of this yang yang is clockwise, and yet the cosmos and some of the comets is opposite, counterclockwise. The tools we'll be using are HB, 2B, and of course a Faber-Castell dust-free eraser, which is not always dust-free, um, but this eraser is used for highlights, such as the comets. You can erase those out. We'll also be using, an, uh, aside from the HB graphite, we'll be using the 4B and most likely a 6B, which is the much more darker, deeper graphite. So it's a softer graphite. And uh, as far as types or brands, I use Derwent, I use Stadler. It really doesn't matter. It's as long as the graphite uh, pencil is a good quality, it would be able to work fine. HB tends to be the workhorse, 4B being for those darker, deeper pieces. Uh, that you're working into and of course the fine may be for some of those tight details. The kneaded eraser is something that is an important part to be able to ever so subtly lighten up those areas of highlights and also take away any, uh, any smudging that you might have. And as you can see I'm kneading it now to get that nice clean spot by folding the areas that we've already used into itself. Now we're going to be working on the male side of the yin yang, which is the bottom half. This is the fire dragon. It is holding the moon. The moon is just like the sun was for the female, uh, the light source. You can see that I'm taking the nibs off of the edge of the pencil. I don't want any sharp areas that might cut into the paper. To be sure of that, I scribble a little bit on a piece of paper. That makes my tip just perfect. So again, keeping in mind that the light source predominantly is the moon. I will also be smudging with the tortillion and you can see me doing some smudging there. That's blending out the graphite that I've already placed in onto the paper. It's a great tool, the tortillion stumps. And, you know, it's one of the most inexpensive tools, but it works great for large areas, which is a paper towel with some really good rough texture to it. Helps blend and soften those gradient tones. Oh yes, and of course, the dark chocolate is a necessity for creative energy. And here we go. So a lot of times I like to go over the line work that I've put in with the HB with maybe just a little bit more pressure, redefine those lines and contours, 
so that when I shadow them, they'll be a little more distinct. Here you can see I'm working on the furthest area away from the light source, which in this case is that moon that the dragon holds. And I'm shadowing at that lower side of the brow, going inside the orbit of the eye, in the eye socket, redefining some of the scale work, the horns. And yes, every now and then you'll wind, you'll find yourself being pulled back to areas that you didn't think you had, you hadn't worked on, and you find out, hey, you know, I think I need to redefine that. So you may find yourself jumping around, and that's a good thing. That keeps the creative energies and the eyes working on symmetry and com composition, structural balance. Here I am working inside the teeth, starting to put in some of those midtones, gradient darks, and shadows. Midtone meaning not quite the darkest arcs, but nowhere near the brights. I'm trying to keep in mind that there's a form, there's amount of height, there's certainly, certainly the height on the foreground, maybe the height to the brow, and I want to make sure that as I imagine how light would cast itself closest to the, in this case, the left side of the face of the male dragon, that it would crest over a little bit, and that would be called f reflective light. So you may notice at the bottom of the cheekbone or even just underneath the brow, there's a little teeny highlight, a little area that I've left. So I haven't shadowed it right to the edge. And that gives it that extra three-dimensional feel. I always tell my students to be conscientious of leaving that little teeny line, uh, especially in areas that are round and that tuck under. Here I am working inside the mouth, getting that cavern a lot darker so it contrasts against the top of the bridge of the nose, just underneath the lip and the beard. And now I begin the very tedious process of shadowing each of these scales to give it a little bit more, each, because each scale needs to have a little bit of a round feel to it. But as I go from the very far left over the crest in the center of the vertebrae and then down across to where the light side is, where the moon would reflect, I will slowly but surely lighten up that shadowing of each scale. But up to that point of the center that runs all the way down the center of the spine, I'm going to keep those darks on the left side of each scale. Again, I'm working with the HB, which is kind of the workhorse. It gives you a pretty good, um, between the dark and lights, I would say on the value scale, it gives you a good 70% of what you'll need. Here I am working on the claw that's holding the moon. Again, keeping in mind as the moon gets very close to that, the very edge where the claw is grabbing it, you want to keep it nice and bright. Same thing with that horn that I just did. And yet at the same time, you want to redefine the section in the moons, maybe some of the craters, just to give it an identification that this is in fact a moon, not just another sun. Now I've switched off to the 4B just to get some extra darks in there. And back to the HB. Now if you notice, I'm just doing the line work on the scales that are closest to the radiating light of the, of the moon. Not dealing with too much shadowing, just kind of darkening each of the contours of each of those scales at the furthest point in which it is away from the light source. Again, redefining those contour lines so they can be clearly seen. The initial line work that I do in the design stage, I usually try to go very light, just enough to lay down the line so I can see them, but not to overdo. I don't want to be putting darks down right away because I use the different darker graphites and or the pressure in which I use my HB later to actually create shadow and, and depth. 
So my initial layout and the line work is usually done with a relatively neutral, you know, out of 100% from dark to light, it would probably be somewhere around 40% darkness. Here I am redefining the anatomical bone structures of the wings, the fingers, if you will. And in this case, the web webbing or the membrane of the wing has a little different feel to it than the female. The female had a lot of ridges in it horizontally. This is more of a almost like a, a rubbery or some kind of a, a bat-like membrane. Pliable. Texture and detail within the membrane, especially to give the effect that it's stretching, is a kind of a, a crucial part uh, to, to making that feel of dimension, you know, that, that, that feeling that it actually concaves a little bit. Going back in with the deeper and darker, softer graphite. Again, this is a combination of realistic European style, more meaty, beefier dragons, but yet given or presented in a way that is the yin yang, which is very Asian. So it's, it's my interpretation of mixing the two cultures together in this one symbol. Now remember, as I had shown in part one, the original piece, which was a full color painting. This was the preliminary line that we're now shadowing. But the original full color painting had the female dragon, which is up above, as a dark blue purple dragon. And the male, which we're working on right now, is actually a yellow orange red, brighter. It's the lighter color of the yin yang. Here I'm doing some cross design work, just a, a little bit of texture here and there, kind of like a pattern just to give it something special, something different. Keeping in mind that the way in which the lines follow the folds helps to accentuate that three-dimensional look. And now it's off to the mountain. So we're working on the outside five elements, which one of them is the mountain. Again, redefining. Brought in the eraser to get some highlights on the areas that would be brighter. Again, the highlighting or the light source being from either the sun or the moon is crucial to have it inward and it's coming from the inside and moving outward. So I'm shadowing the outside of these uh, elemental aspects of the piece, and in this case the mountain, and leaving the left or the inside highlighted. Again, the five elements are fire, mountain, iron ore, water, and wood. Here I am shadowing in the iron ore. I've got a sword and katana there. And now using that tortillion, we're going to start blending and shadowing to give a little more of a, of a body or feel of roundness to it. Blending in those shadowed scales that I 
can work to really give a good casting of shadow there. Shadows of pushing things back, the highlights of bringing things forward. You know, you can really push and pull with the shadows and with the tortillion tool. Uh, the tortillons are just amazing to do that. And so I'll go over the entire piece that I did, all of the different shadowing work. And then once I'm completed with that shadowing, I'll go back in with the eraser and highlight again. And now even going back to where I was working with the waterfall, you start to move around because you know that the background and some of the other elements have yet to be done. So it's, it's kind of important that if you see an area somewhere in your piece that may not be right where you're working, don't be afraid to jump around. So we have some of the ice and water droplets coming down from below the head of the male dragon, forming into icicles. So it goes from water to ice. So we're not only dealing with the element of water, but we're also dealing with its different formations. Once again, that blending tortillion smudging tool, uh, the stump is fantastic to really take that three-dimensional shadowing effect. I still keep some of the line work, but I like to be able to get that feeling of true shadow. Once again, going back in and seeing things that needed to be worked on, you can throw in some darker graphite with the 4B that I'm using currently. Just redefining those lines, redefining those scales. And you just make it pop when you do that. The background is essentially done by just laying down a lot of graphite. You can do it with both the HB and, as you can see, I'm switching from the blue to the black, which is an HB to a 4B where I get into those really dark areas of the cosmos and the space, I'm going to just lay in some heavy, heavy graphite in the 4B or the 6B. And then afterwards, go in with the smudging tool and blend it. As you can see, I'm working around the, the comets. I also change the direction in which my stroke of the pencil is being done. Kind of like crosshatch, if you will. That helps when blending it as well especially with the tooth of the paper. Which, by the way, this paper I'm using has about a mid-grade tooth. It's, it's a Strathmore. I believe it's the 400 series. And you see, I went right ahead and went right to the paper towel since we had such a large area. And I'm just going to start blending this all out, smudging that in. the dust-free eraser, pulling back those comet tails, redefining the planets, putting some additional 
dark shadows, kind of like uh, cosmic waves or celestial entities. Cleaning up the eraser periodically is a good thing to do. That's what I just did there. And now I'm going down into the ice as it drips. I'm pulling it down with the eraser. Gives it not only a sharper, cleaner look, but it also gives that appearance of that glow. Also, as we put these different types of embellishments within the cosmos in the background, it's an opportunity occasionally to hide objects. I love to hide objects in my pieces. And keep in mind, uh, you try your best not to smudge the areas you're working on. Normally, I'll have a piece of paper under my palm of my hand, but we don't want to do that for the purposes of the demonstration and block your view. And there you have it, folks, the Yin Yang Dragon. This was created with European-style dragons formatted into the Yin Yang symbol. It was both terrestrial and celestial in its design elements. It incorporated the five elements, fire, mountain, iron ore, water, and wood. This came from the original preliminary drawing that was done for the painting Yin Yang, which was featured in a variety of products and still available on my website as t-shirts, blankets, and other products at edbeardjr.com. I want to thank you for tuning in to the Artist Ed Beard Jr.'s time-lapse demo and instruction series, this being our first in the series of time-lapse. So tune in again and check frequently with us. We will be featuring everything from different techniques in acrylic, automotive airbrush, as well as more black and whites. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you again. Many of my collectors and fans know me from the 30 plus years of visiting my Renaissance Fair gallery shops or even seeing me at the trade shows or as a guest artist at conventions. They've enjoyed the art prints, t-shirts, and other collectibles that I manufacture always in the U.S. and sell. You can learn more about that at my main site, which is edbeardjr.com. And by the way, while you're there, please sign up for the social media group Dragon Lord and Friends. That can be found at edbeardjr.com groups. This way you can interact with me and other like-minded fans of the fantastic, as well as automotive custom airbrush. And by the way, for those who would really like to see this in real time and interact and watch live demonstrations, they can come on over to my Patreon. There's tons of perks, great giveaways. In fact, we do a free gift away each episode. You can find more about that at patreon.com slash artist edbeardjr. So once again, that's www.patreon.com forward slash artist edbeardjr.